Uh, I think, well, I think we should talk about in the, because I would say that the current expectation, the current version of the NICL has failed compared to its counterparts in China, Korea, Europe. What do you think is the best solution? Because as at the start, you said you didn't believe that the current iteration was a good format, but just killing it outright without a plan is a bad idea. So I'm curious what you think the perfect version or maybe not perfect, but best possible functional version of an amateur scene would be unique to the Americas if it has different problems, as you said, from these other regions. Yeah, I think number one is our, our top line piece add promotion relegation to the LCS. In their first post, they disingenuously claimed that they were adding true promotion, they're adding promotion and relegation. Well, that was just that the LCS orgs get promoted down to amateur and out of the NACL. Um, what we want is them to actually put real promotion relegation in. If you do that, we've already seen in Valorant, you don't have promotion relegation, all of the major orgs leave the tier two scene. You add it back in, it's, they flood back. There's a clear, like there's a clear proof point here you put this in place, your scene will be healthy. There will be real incentives that make sense in the marketplace. So that's the number one ask. Um, you know, obviously we talked a little bit at the very top. We would take promotion, true promotion relegation for all teams over Valorant style as our absolute um, gold standard. But we realize and we're not. Unre we try not to be unrealistic in our expectations. Like we realize that's a very hard thing to disentangle, unlikely to happen. But what Valorant did, we say, why not? Why not us? Yeah, but you know it works. It isn't part of the issue though that with the val like at least with the lcs there's already kind of a lack of professional player talent within the 10 teams of the lcs and indeed some people have argued that the lcs should be reduced in terms of size to maybe eight teams so would this come along with a shift towards the vct system where perhaps that brazilian or latin american players would be able to be fielded within these rosters without taking up import slots like the oceanic players are currently which would allow potentially a, an expansion of the league because we are talking about expanding the number of teams sure that would result that would re result in expansion for sure uh i would say right now you have a reality that because of the system there are teams that just aren't trying to operate to be um to be successful i think that's more problematic than the talent pipeline like there's players with talent out there there's a lot of players in nacl who could have been on teams in the playoffs or could have been on teams making it to MSI. Like I a hundred percent believe that. Um, and you have some teams that have operated without, um, you know, without proper staffing or without proper focus and investment in, in trying to be competitive. So uh, I think that that's probably your core problem. Uh, combining and bringing more talent in and, and making more of an America's region. I if we're expanding, certainly open to that. Um, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of awesome players down there. We've seen a ton of, you know, we see I'm on the v, the Valorant side too, and we see a ton of problems here. These organizations that have been required to come to the United States and create U.S. entities, it's been a huge mess trying to, you know, trying to teach someone how to, you know, as Richard said, it's not easy to operate in America. And if you've never done it before and you're asked to do it overnight and set up an operation in Los Angeles, there's a lot of big challenges. We'd love, you know, if we're going to go that conversation, we definitely need to have a conversation with Riot about how to set it up for more success because um, there's been a, a lot of, really problematic things out of the gate on the Valorant side that we've been spending a lot of time trying yeah. to trying to fix. So it's, uh, there's, I think there's pluses and there's minuses. We need to fix the, the known downsides before we can get to doing it. But uh, absolutely a conversation we'd be willing to have if we're willing to move to a world where we're actually setting up a pipeline that makes sense. Isn't it like, do you also think that perhaps that's why, you know, I, I don't know if there's a world where we couldn't have this in the States, but isn't it problematic that all of this has to happen in California? Like, you know, I, I think one of the big issues is if you're looking at cutting costs and making more money from the LCS, it would be significantly less expensive on the teams and on Riot to not operate in Los Angeles. That is insane. Yeah. I mean, our, our players, you know, certainly a lot of them now lived in Los Angeles for a long time. It's their home. It's where they're going to stay. But when they chose where they were franchising and that they were going to set up in Los Angeles, that was entirely Riot just selfishly saying, we have offices here and we want to go to the games ourselves and we want to be, we want to be near it. Yeah. And everybody knew when it happened that Chicago servers were, were a thing, were going to be a thing. And it didn't make any sense for where the player base was and where the servers were going to be. They did it anyways. So again, that's 100% on Riot. They made that call and now everybody's eating the cost side of it. Um, we would, again, our players want to play. People talk about players are lazy. They just want their paychecks. That's all bullshit. 
every player I ever talked to, like most of them could go to college, could get a degree, become a coder, make six figures. They're make something that's not dissimilar from what they're making today. They love to compete. They love the game. They love to play. And they don't, most of them don't give a shit where they play. They just say, we want to be together. We want to train. I want a chance to win and compete. And they, you know, they cry their eyes out when they lose in the finals or if their career doesn't go where they want it to believe it can make it, you know, they're committed. And like that, you know, this, where they're playing in Los Angeles, that's not what matters to them most. They just want an opportunity to play. And if you told them the LCS was gone tomorrow, unless it was in Chicago, they'd happily be there. I'm sure most of them would happily be there anyways, so that they're, they could have low latency for their, for their solo queue. So yeah, that one's on Riot. I don't know if they'll ever disentangle it at this point. They've invested so much in the space, but yeah. I mean, I I just don't believe that's true. Like, you could easily change that building. I mean, I've worked in that building. You could easily change that building into additional office space for Riot. It's across the street from the campus. It doesn't have to be a studio. It's not worthless real estate. You could sell it, uh, you know? Yes. And (laughs) now you have many team, you know, many of those team organizations, though, because of that decision, have now invested in these you know, sometimes, you know, boondoggle decisions around these huge training facilities, but they're massively invested. You move them out of California. Now they've got these enormous loss leaders. You know, there's a, there's a lot to disentangle there. I I think it sucks, but I don't disagree with you. I I bet you, Phil, that breaking those corporate leases is, is actually cheaper than continuing to operate in Los Angeles. I think if you picked up those operations and moved them outside of California that you would, yeah, you'd suffer some immediate costs, but I think that over the next five years, you'd probably save some money. That's my anticipation. It is just so outrageously expensive um, to operate these kind of facilities in Los Angeles. And especially with all the additional costs that come with running companies. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think you're totally right. So, I mean, I like, I, I don't really buy that. I think that there could be a move somewhere else uh, that would be quite easy. And like you say, Chicago would be the logical one because of the servers and the ping that the pro players would be experiencing. And Chicago is significantly cheaper. It's very cheap <laughs> comparatively, comparatively to a lot of the other spots they could go and is closer to the heart of their player base, which is definitely in the Eastern and Central time zones because that's where two thirds of the American population is. You know, yep. the West Coast is is difficult. Um, it's just that downside where you have to hire that robot from RoboCop to protect the building that the players play. But aside from that, yeah, I guess it's all right. <laughs> oh, Listen, man. Ed 209's got to work as well. Like the fucking the <laughs> robot union's right on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's still cheaper. It's still cheaper to hire, to build the robots. Um, uh, but yeah, I look, I, I think that, I think that there are so many issues that have compiled over the years with LCS. I mean, we've talked about them in terms of the revenue that they've done. Like at first they were terrible at selling sponsorships when it was at its peak. Um, And then they, when they got sponsors, they didn't do very much with them and didn't provide a lot of value. And so now those sponsors are leaving. And especially as you see the decrease in the viewership, it's been difficult for them. So I, I mean, it's hard to feel super bad for riot or the teams given what has gone on. And I know the players may not have as much, have had the ability to unionize given what you've said uh, about the necessity of riot and them fighting potentially uh, uh, the creation of a union, which obviously even all of the players collectively together could not go against the legal and monetary might of riot games. uh, Even if they were contributing part of their salaries in order to engage in that activity. Now they might be able to successfully win a PR war by doing that, which may force riots hands in certain ways, but If I was Riot, I would also be scared that if the players successfully unionized against me, that maybe my own employees would start to unionize against me. And I think that's probably somewhat of a concern of theirs as well, which is that there could be a a knock-on effect that would be massively uh, detrimental to the, the 10 cents bottom line. Let's put it that way. Uh, just as well, just to get a reaction to this, uh, I don't know if you can say, Phil, is your read on this announcement, which I know we all suspected was coming down the pipe tonight, uh, is your read on this that it's basically a fuck you to the Players Association, or is it almost like, a, okay, you've got a point to their partner orgs because 
There's nothing in this. I've read it a couple of times now while we've been talking. There's nothing in this that says there's going to be any punitive measures to the LCS teams that pulled out, even though, as we established earlier in the podcast, it's a contractual obligation that they have. No, well, so, Riot's removed the contractual obligation. So right. there were, we're not ex expecting or asking for punitive measures against the teams in this. In okay. This so, so, so in other words, I mean, is this not a like, c could you also read the system saying, yeah, you sort of do have a point and we just want you to remain in LCS and we'll all get, we'll all muddle through this together. Or do you explicitly read this as like a fuck you? Uh, I've read it as lip service, just continuing to, you know, act like everything's okay and putting bullet points down to make it look like you're doing things without actually doing things. Actually, I look at the second bullet point um, that they've <laughs> the got in there. What is so funny? Or, sorry, it, they have a lot of bullet points, actually. Uh, <laughs> when you go down to the what is NACLAK LCS challenger section, second bullet point yeah. there, which is what they've hung a lot of this on, is that there's going to be this expanded competitive, you know, international event for developmental systems to compete cross-regionally. You know, we've been talking about this with them for a while behind the scenes, and they've said they're talking about it, they're thinking about it. It's really telling here that this bullet point says as early as 2024. They're not even telling you it's happening in 2024. They're just trying to sell you that, like, eh, maybe we'll get it to 2024. They don't, they haven't planned it out no. beyond the sketch stage at all, and they know that they can't even commit to it because it's not actually a part of the plan. They don't have a plan. It's it's, just, it's yeah. the same shit that in those John Needham statements and interviews where they say, oh, yeah, we're going to create esports specific digital goods. What are they, John? When are they coming, John? Ah, oh, nothing about either of those things. You know, <laughs> we need to monetize esports in a way that's never d been done before. We're making our own streaming platform. Will, <laughs> okay. will, it, be will, it, will it be exclusive, John, so that you can yeah. guarantee that there is higher revenue? No, that this is a marketing exercise. No, no, it's a marketing exercise. So it's not a business endeavor for us. It's a marketing exercise. So yeah, we want it to be where, what, what do they say? Their line is, we want to be everywhere our fans are. So no, our streaming platform won't be exclusive. Of course not. Of course not. No, no, no. We need to be on Twitch and YouTube as well because the reach and the marketing is the most important thing is the implication. They are not actually driving revenue. Well, it is driving revenue, just in a different way. <laughs> Yeah, they literally said that as well, didn't they? As it re relates to Valorant, didn't they? Just recently, didn't they say they didn't ever want to put any content behind a paywall because it limits reach? I think yeah, it was always, Leo always, Farrier. Yeah. That's it's always just, I mean, okay, I guess. <laughs> like, let, let's, have, let's have this endless reach to an audience where no one pays anything. And offers absolutely no value whatsoever to the this ecosystem. I'm sick of the word ecosystem. Actually, we really need to stop using that word because we don't have an ecosystem anywhere in esports. An ecosystem is where everything is in perfect harmony. Exactly. Yes, you have, yes, you have apex <laughs> predators that come and eat the little fish, but there's so many of the little fish. It's okay. They constantly reject. There's none of that. None of that's going on in esports. It's just everyone wants to be a fucking apex predator, and no one wants to be the fish. No one's happy with where they are in a fucking. Food food chain you know <laughs> like nothing sustains itself it's just constant apocalypse on the horizon it's like this is a nightmare guys so like we gotta if they, we have to go back to basics none of this is sustainable i mean listen i have some sympathy with the players obviously like i want i'm like duncan like i i do believe in like free market principles i wouldn't want to see by the way like a salary cap i wouldn't want to see capped earnings i think if you're the best at something you should make as much as the market can sort of sustain but that's the key word again it's like right now everything we do we don't monetize the fans we don't we don't uh, do right by the sponsors. We promised them a bunch of bullshit and the orgs completely betrayed it. By the way, there's a reason why so many of these orgs are losing sponsors. They're blaming economic downturn. Actually, in real terms, the economic downturn in marketing is about 7% in America. It's not that big at all, despite the fact we're meant to be functionally in a recession. So what's actually going on? Well, when you look into it, they're not hitting the deliverables. So the sponsors are going out, and then the orgs, rather than take responsibility for that, are looking to cut corners, you know? Maybe some leagues shouldn't exist. Maybe some esports products are bad. That's not necessarily the fault of the players. Although I will add, I do sort of observe players do take a lot out of the ecosystem without really offering as much value as maybe they should like yes they're players yes they're great yes they you can sell a jersey you know if they're the best although again no one buys those jerseys so fuck that for a theory but like 
they don't do media work. They don't create content. They 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 offer very little that's monetizable beyond their skills. And as we've established, that's not actually monetizable at all. And then you get to the games developers who they don't even really care about esports. It's just a, it's just a cool little experiment that they can just sort of have tacked onto the side, a tumor they can excise at any time and walk away from healthy. That like. That we we've never had an esports ecosystem in the in the history of esports actually, and yeah. you know I, I want us to build one, but yeah, like we got to take some backward steps. Someone somewhere is going to have to take a hit. I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's the players. I don't know if it's the orgs. I don't know if it's the developers. I did certainly, I mean, the fans couldn't offer any less than what they do right now. They are a That's number so on a fucking spreadsheet. Cheers, <laughs> lads. Uh, <laughs> well, but, it, no, they're a number yeah. on a spreadsheet that's not in a dollar column. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Richard, well, one thing, that, one thing you're alluding to here, Richard, is right. why I even said earlier I would like players to get involved in the initiative. You know what? One thing players could do tomorrow, they could collectively agree to not a hard salary cap. They could, they could themselves decide what it, they think is a reasonable amount to make and there could not be players making millions of dollars while there isn't the 100k or 75k for the guy in the academy oh. that's an example where i suspect philip could disagree i don't think those players will ever take that action i don't I think mean, they would even care to i, I think I, it's I wanna, absurd I, I, to ask any employee who has the least power in the marketplace knows the least about the fundamentals of the business and the financials to say i'm offered x dollars and i should tell you no 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 you're paying me too much i should take less that's like sure. as a free market <laughs> person you should you should like be against I'll, the thing I'll, you're very I'll, saying. I'll, like... I'll, I'll add one of the problems we've had in CS, and I don't know how relevant say, okay. it is to League, but but like agents, right? Like agents have come in, and what they've done is they've negotiated like insane contracts for their clients. And what they do is they say, look, I'm getting you 50K a month, right? And the player goes, 50K a month, more is better. Well, that player, like, so I won't name names, but there was one player who was at one point one of the highest paid players in the world, great agent, actually wasn't one of the great players in the world. His his salary to skill didn't align whatsoever. And he ended up being benched by the organization because it activated the clause in his contract where it cut like, I don't know, 70% of his salary down. And he stayed on the bench for this unbelievably long period of time because it simply wasn't worth it to the org to honor the salary and to have him earning full salary and playing because he simply wasn't good enough to justify it. So things like that are starting to bleed through into esports. So while I while I take like, yeah, I get what you're saying, Phil. Like no one's gonna say pay me less money. That's just not human nature. But also you sort of have to look at the the you know, the X's and O's and be like is it better to make more money for one year or slightly less for three? And I don't think players are making like very informed decisions. Again, that's helped sustain an ecosystem that they're totally dependent upon. You use well, that remember word ecosystem. The teams, thought it was the teams should they, the teams shouldn't try and pay the minimum to the players. I'm a moron, of course. That's not a free market concept. What's so stupid about this discussion, mate, is you you literally just go between the abstract and the specific whenever it suits your point. While I even concede to you, here's a case I'm making that's against my principle. What about this? I actually try to build a bridge with you, mate. All you do is if you don't like it, you go for the easy dunk, you go for the well, there's a lot there, you do the, the thing where you deride what I do. Here's the thing, mate. I didn't invite you on this show. You weren't my choice of guest. I don't know whose fucking cousin you are or which mate of these you are in the chat, but I've quite frankly done my best to give you your room to speak. I've tried even to suggest topics that would be interesting. But if the idea that pro players don't earn millions of dollars while pretending to care, who will not walk out of this thing, by the way, about the little guy they don't give a fuck about an academy is an insane concept to you, then all I'll say is this. Shut the fuck up telling team owners what they can do with the money they make and what they can do. You said earlier, Oh, what's the big difference between going bankrupt? Bankrupt, you said. Not like just have a hard time in league. Bankrupt in August or September. I'll tell you why, son. You were in Evil Geniuses. They don't only support League of Legends. The way you make a multi esports team is you have one game where you spend millions and try and be the best. You offset it with like Rocket League or Rainbow Six that makes more skin money. You try and balance it out. And so, you know what? When that team goes bankrupt for the sake of your academy players, a load of people lose their jobs in Rocket League, in CSGO, in FIFA, in whatever the fuck other games games exist, TFT, that I don't even know about. So if you want to be glib, mate, we could just go back to that whole thing. I just tried to make a point there. I also made it an abstract as well. So there you go. You win another one, mate. Another one for Philip. Brilliant. No, <laughs> I, no. I'm not scoring. Can I, can I respond? Because it is coming out pretty hard. 
I, I genuinely appreciate that you drive like a hard conversation the other way. And I think we come at, we come from two pretty far paradigms on, on these things. And so we oftentimes are not very close. I think that's, that's fine. Uh, I, uh, I'm surprised at the level of, um, you know, at the level of, uh, you know, your level of reaction to the conversation we're having. I, I felt like this has been a fine conversation the whole time and I've appreciated your pushback and I hope you appreciate mine. Uh, I want to say specifically to the team side and who's responsible in these things. Like I was at evil geniuses for a long time. I was there and I was a part of the group. It was well reported. We went after Chovy for $3 million and let's get back to like where, you know, where this is all coming from. Chovy didn't ask us. You didn't, he didn't have someone putting out feelers saying, Hey, $3 million. I'll consider coming to the LCS. No LCS team sat in the corner and we said, what do you think it'll take to get a top flight young Korean talent to come overseas right away? And we went and we made the offer. That's what players experience 99% of the time. It's the teams setting the market and talking about what they can do to get the talent that they want, what the other teams are doing. And they're doing the same thing, again, when player salaries aren't involved, when you look at the buyouts for many years, where teams were paying each other, no player involved in the decision-making or negotiating, millions of dollars to move contracts around. This is a This is a situation driven by the teams on the salary side. Absolutely. They have a bottom line that they should be accountable to. And that's, that, that's the simple truth. It's their, it is their responsibility to know what they can and can't afford to spend and not go above it. And I, I get back to the biggest problem, which is new owner syndrome. You talk about the ecosystem. The problem, a big driver of that problem is that we have a system that is driven by new owners. And you look at basketball, my preferred sport, and you got Matt Ishbia, new owner syndrome 101. Mm-hmm. What does he do? He buys the Phoenix Suns, and less than an hour later, he trades away the entire future. There, Mikhail Bridges, who goes and starts scoring 30 points a game, all their picks, everything, to get an aging superstar in Kevin Durant, who is great, to try and win a championship today. Because he's a new owner, he's got a new shiny toy, and he's got an ego, and he wants to win now. And he tells his people, go spend the money. And guess what happened in esports? We created a franchise system that caused everyone to go out and get new owners, because you needed to raise money, so you need to bring in new capital. You bring in new owners, what do they want? They want to win now. They tell their people. Go win now. Spend the money. It doesn't matter if it makes sense in the books. Now I want to win. I want to go to the Worlds. I want to win Worlds. I want to be the first team. We're going to be the best. We're going to be the Yankees. We're going to be the Lakers, et cetera. That's what's been happening for years in this ecosystem. And it's not, and it has been what has destroyed that term because we're not operating with any sort of sense. We're operating with a bunch of people who are trying to be the best historically. And it's caused a big rift and a big problem because of it. And I think that gets around to a, a big part of the problem is you have a lot of people who've been driving decisions, not with the logic of, of what the finances were, but because of they're new and they wanted to win. And that's why you see less streaming because players got told, hey, we're paying you to try and win. We're going to Worlds. I don't want you streaming. I don't want people seeing what you're playing. You know, I want you to play on alt accounts and I don't want you to stream. I want you to play eight hours of scrims. And then I want you to go play solo queue in quiet and try and get better because we're trying to win. That's where the priority is. We're not putting streaming hours in your contracts anymore. We're not put doing content anymore. We got we hired a, a high end we hi, hired a high end coach from Korea who said I don't want to shoot content. I don't want to be in content. I want to focus on winning. This is not the way, right? So all these things add up and most of it is driven by the fact you had new ownership come in from franchising getting created because you needed to get investors who said we're going to win now and they blew up the model. And I give a lot of credit to a group like um complexity who did get new ownership but they stuck to the budget and they stuck to the plan those guys over there frankly continue to say we have a budget we stick to it sometimes we get good and then we can't afford to pay the players what we can't afford to pay and they move on and we try and rebuild like props to them frankly and we need more groups like them out there who are trying to be mindful of how to run an operation even with investment dollars how to be financially responsible in your case why do you think that EG wanted to spend $3 million on Chovy. Like what was the end goal of that happening? Yeah, right? we had a, we had a lot of stuff in our, in our thinking. One, we wanted to compete. We wanted to try and win. And we thought there was an opportunity with everything going on uh, with that org- with his organization. And do you remember the, the controversy around the agents who were also a part of the team and, um, and that whole thing from a few years ago. So we thought there was a, a vacuum here of top talent who's going to be available. We thought that, even if we didn't get it, it was going to make us credible. That was a big thing. We we're like, this is a moonshot. It's probably not going to work anyways. Maybe three million is not even enough. It wasn't enough uh, at that time, uh, obviously. 
but we did feel like if we went for it, it would make us credible in the space. There was a big problem of teams that had come in and had built relations, built reputations quickly as organizations that players didn't want to play for because they didn't think they were serious about competing. They thought they'd get caught in a budget team and then they'd never look good and they'd never get an opportunity to get a big contract. So by going for Chovy, we knew it would certainly get known to the public because it was a big deal. And players would immediately be like, well, that team wants to win. And that was a, you know, that had an impact. So we we're like, yeah, let's swing for it. And now I look back on it. I'm like, thank fuck. The second he said, no, we all said, thank fucking God. What were we thinking? Like that was literally, I looked at Greg and we like, we were sweating <laughs> buckets and he said, no. And we were like, holy shit. Like our palms were sweating. And we were like, we almost fucking did that thing. That would have been the craziest thing we've ever fucking done. A hundred percent. And we almost did it. And like, I, you know, it was like, I look back on it. I'm like, oh my God, what was I thinking? But I, I appreciate that honestly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I fucked up plenty on the team side for sure. Like I'm absolutely complicit in a large in a large part of this. And I feel like it gives me something to say about it too, because I actually know what it's like on that side. I know what it's been what like. What was what was the mandate that was coming from the new owners though? They were just like win and then that will make us money. Like what was the logical projection of why they were splashing out or why they wanted to be aggressive? Yeah, I mean, I, I think not just from that ownership group from, from other groups we talked to about investment and wanting to be in the space and talking to other owners and what their situation was. You know, we saw really frequently across the space, across a number of teams that I don't need to name because you can look at them and see what their strategy was and because they were spending to try and be competitive. A lot of teams believed this core philosophy that the cheapest championship to win in esports was going to be the championship you won today. And championships lead to prestige, lead to long-term success in sports. Like if you are an organization with a long history, the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Lakers, the Celtics, it's an institutional advantage in the long term. And a lot of these groups came in and said, well, it's the cheapest, it's, it looks expensive on paper today, but it's going to be cheaper than the one we get next year. So let's do it and let's buy those early championships because it's going to pay off dividends in the long term. You know, and it gets to some of the fallacy around how big the esports market was going to grow and the idea that it was, you know, kind of a um, a graph heading towards infinite and not something that was more linear or even something that was going to plateau. Um, I think that's that's a, a big issue that that struck a lot of teams. Um, and, you know, I think there's a pride part, though. I've seen it. I've seen it in multiple teams, like ownership groups, like if they have money, they want to win. Then they say, well, if that's what it costs to win, we're going to go try and win. But I think the core a big core of that is saying these championships are cheap today. They're going to be more expensive tomorrow. Time value money. Let's spend it. Let's do it. Yeah. And to, to Thorin's point about, um, you know, I, I, I agree with what you were saying, Thorin, about how, you know, to not talk about how people or judge how people are spending their money. But I think the core issue here is that none of us and very few people on planet Earth know exactly how much money is esports is making because it's it's going to change from publisher to publisher. And it's basically just locked inside a vault in the executive suite. And like that's why these conversations get so confusing, because nobody can actually put the proper value on what the teams should be spending, what the players should be making like. There could be a massive like the players could should be the teams and players should or could be making significantly more money if there were transparent financials. Right. And I think that's why, why I said at the beginning, I wanted to frame the whole conversation every time as players would benefit in this way. If this happened, yeah. team orgs would benefit this way. The kid, instead, what we did is coming in. This is why, look, understandably, I understand people's own inherent biases and ones that they've chosen to be complicit in through the jobs that they're doing and the people they're fighting for. I don't have a dog in this fight. If I'm doing abstract i would just talk about the open quake circuit fucking 20 years ago that's not what you guys are talking about so in this particular scenario i just don't like it when people come in with loaded angles of sort of like well they should do that and the implication well, you're a piece of shit if you don't you don't care about that it's like fucking hell we can do that all everyone can point fingers all the way around if you do that like i don't think you get anywhere so to me it actually makes a lot more sense actually i think you can even get through to fans and pros if you actually outline why people might seem selfish but are just incentivized to fight for their own own particular situation. That's why I just say I don't really buy the idea that the pro players are so altru 
altruistic. I imagine part of it is things like they have a mate in academy and they don't really think yet yeah, it'll cost them any money or cause them anything. They know they'll get some likes on Twitter. They maybe even do think I might be shit in a year like some of the actual good players he referenced were. I might have to bounce down there and I still want that. All I'll tell you is I did an interview recently where a player said he didn't even mind being put down in an academy even though he could definitely have been a starter because essentially he was bing chilling on 100k with all his team house paid for. He didn't even have to perform to a high level and he knew essentially if the chance comes again and I'm in good solo queue form, not having to play all the scrims. They told me some of these academy teams don't scrim. He said basically you're just waiting for your chance again for the free chance to come back up. Who the fuck wants to go back to a normal job and you don't want to be fucking Kurt Warner bagging groceries and hope you get your call up. So I just think it's, <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense to essentially put like moral judgments or impetus behind a, a scenario where yes, if we consider this like a scenario like an American financial system, everyone is acting in their own self-interest. The economic theory even is that's how you balance out all these interests is that if everyone in some ways is a bit selfish, then in that sense, the, the actual negotiation gets us closer to a compromise which should bring it back to the riot thing. That's why riots ultimate autocratic power is a nightmare. The best deals always are when everyone gives up something to get what ultimately they really want and something ideally collectively we all want. To see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content, well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.